Hey, I'm on here too. I was like, hey, just come on. Um, I went ahead and sent the link to. So I can't contact Sylvia, or maybe I can't ask her to do be her friend. I sent that to her. So I did. I just sent it to her, but I. I'm not sure if it's just going to be a message request or an actual message because I thought it said we were friends, but then she just never pulls up. I have to go. Anyway, so I sent it to her. I just don't know that she's going to see it from me. But I sent it to Emily and Jake. And you want me to send it to Grayson real fast? Send it to Jake already? Yeah, I sent it to Jake and Emily and Sylvia. Do you want me to send Grayson? I sent it to Grayson now. Emily's not joining us today, but yes. I just sent it to him. Oh, I thought Emily was. And then more. There we go. All that's coming together. All right, that's all fine there. Hello and welcome to your investor party. I'm your hostess with the most of Jacob Jennings. Welcome, welcome one and all. I am so excited to get this started, guys. We are um, going live on Facebook. Let me make sure I said the right thing. Uh, yes. So we, we, what we're trying to do right now is get um, more educated, everybody. Because as you know, a diverse portfolio isn't just having real estate. It isn't just having stock, just having commodities. It's a little bit of everything. And that's what makes sense for your profile, your portfolio, yes? So this is not going to be easy, but it's going to be a shit ton of fun. So everybody I'd like to you to welcome our incredible you got a great room today oh my god i'm so excited um i want to introduce our guest panelists that we have today we have um jake lamore who was a trainer and uh stock trainer and real estate student as well brilliant speaker uh he was a 21 year old savant we have emily murray as you guys know i never say your last name right Muri. where can't i say your last name you're doing just fine <laughs> You are so kind. Here I am butchering. I'm like, we got M. She's here to help us. Uh, she's our resident expert, our stock expert. She does everything that I don't know better than I ever could. So I let her answer any question. Plus, she's prettier than me. So when I have a bad day, I put this on the screen and let her do all the talking. It's much easier. So, and then we also have our amazing, oh my God, Sylvia Cook. Let me tell you, this is why I love Sylvia. I only worked with her a couple of times when we were on the road. But this woman was sitting right beside me on a Friday afternoon. And while the rest of us are in there trying to like talk about real estate, she's at her computer, blah, 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 blah. She stopped, she goes, hmm. I said, what? She's like, I just made a thousand dollars for me and my son in three hours. I walked away. I was like, huh? What did you do? I had to learn how to do that. <laughs> do you remember that, Sylvia? Unmuting you. Try it again. I think you're muted, honey. Unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah, you oh go. yeah. I I do remember uh, Fridays are my favorite day to trade. I love Fridays. Yeah. That's good. Why do you love Fridays? Why is that such a great day to trade? Uh, there's usually a lot of activity on Friday because the market's getting ready to close for the weekend. Um, if you're not trading futures or Forex, which I trade mostly stock and options. And so you see movement in the options. They actually, like, I call it pinning. They'll pin to a certain price. Um, and you learn this with time by watching the charts. Um, and so you can make uh, a quick 200, 300, 1,000. On a Friday. I mean, you can do it anytime throughout the week as well. Um, tr the stocks are trending very, very well right now. So I do some trending as well, but I love my Fridays. Okay. Um, so everybody else who's watching this right now, look at me very, very closely <laughs> because uh, you're going to see this. 
I don't know much more about stocks than what they've told me. Okay, <laughs> I've taken I've taken a couple classes in stocks. I know enough to be dangerous and not know and then pass you off to people who are smarter than me. So what you're about to learn <laughs> are from people who are significantly smarter than me. Like a lot, uh, except for Jake. So we're so glad that you guys are here to ask questions <laughs> and see what's going on. Now, let me also tell you who else is in this room so it makes more sense for you. you get it? This is so cool. Um, by the way, panelists, it's the first time we're doing something like this where we're trying to get multiple people in a row to share your knowledge because it's not about me, it's about the community, right? So, oh my God, I look so good with this shirt and that plant. Look at this. Anyway. Um, I digress. So what we're trying to do, apparently, is attracting higher quality people. Like Anita's on the call today, and so is Grace and Kupfer, our two coaches, our two uh, chiefs for Real Estate Survivor, two of our three chiefs, and it's so exciting. So um, to, hi, Grace, and hi, Anita. Hey. Welcome. I like the shirt. I like the shirt, Jacob. Thank you. It looks better on the floor. Most of my clothes do anyway. So, yeah. Mine too. <laughs> That's why we get along. I have to say, Anita's probably the person I've spoken to most getting out of the shower, except for Elise. She happens to call me all the time when I'm in the bathroom. I don't know how that works out, but there you go. Um, and then everybody else in the call so far, we've got, uh, they're all real estate survivor students and contestants, which is awesome. So we're gonna, let me tell you guys what's going on. They're going to jump in and uh, see how things are working. We are going to be doing a stock survivor. Oh my God, yes, you heard that right. I'm making it official, Emily. We're putting it right out there for everybody in this chat room and the cyber world to hear. Yes, we are doing a stock survivor. Emily and I are putting it together. Elise is doing everything on the back end. Nelson, guess what? You're being roped in. You don't know it yet, but you are. And we are going to be doing something very similar to real estate survivor. We are going to have a couple of coaches come on and they are going to be trading and teaching people how to trade with them. So if you're interested in that, then stick around. For the next few days, we're gonna be having Emily, Sylvia, Jake, and uh, Maria at some point coming in and talking about what they're doing to trade, what they're looking for, so you can understand why it's important to know about stocks and why to trade. Now, real estate and stocks have a lot of parallels and a lot of similarities, but just as close as they are related, they're also worlds apart. So you're learning that on Friday. So Emily, my dear, what the f is going on right now in the stock market? Same as usual, markets are going up. I mean, there's a little bit of a sell-off today. We kind of gapped up this morning, but now there's a little bit of a sell-off. But you know, since um, since we hit like that bottom back in March, the stocks have just been going up in certain uh, sectors, obviously. The distressed areas, your airlines, your banks, your hotels, your casinos are still, um, you know, struggling, but everything else tech wise, you know, pretty much th think any tech company you can possibly think of. And it's, you know, obviously appreciated in price over, you know, over the last few months. So markets are just going up. It's like whatever's happening outside the world is just, you know, eh. <laughs> so, Jake, I'm so glad you're here because you're the other crazy person besides me and Emily. Emily's so polite. She won't say anything to be too controversial. You will. Jake, since the markets seem to be divorced from reality, and there seems to be absolutely no end in sight that apparently the dollar can be stretched forever, it's practically made out of bubble gum and elastic. What do you think is happening right now? Sylvia, same question. Uh, great question. Uh... I, I think that the markets are not driven on an economic reality of the companies that you're analyzing. I think there's, there's a massive divergence um, for people who are value investors, fundamental analysis. You know, like a lot of real estate investing is analyzing a deal and understanding what uh, the, the value of, a, of an asset and in getting dollar, into sorry. that asset undervalued. In this marketplace, that isn't working with stocks because it doesn't matter what's actually going on with the companies. It's all about the Federal Reserve. It's all about what they're doing to inject capital into the monetary system. Uh, and, and I think part of it has been access to markets that, driv that drove a little bit of the rally uh, prematurely. So we're talking the Robin Hood rally, the, the traders that 
recently have been able to put their capital into the markets in a very short order in a very fast manner with without any barriers it's never really been like this right even back in 07 08 it wasn't like everybody got on youtube get together all at the same time with with nothing else to do by the way right i mean the large majority of stimulus checks went to trading accounts and brokerage accounts right you know so all these people had this money and just started clicking buttons and they knew how to buy. Um, and then, then you have Wall Street sitting back wondering, well, why is it going up so fast? Why is it going up so hard? This doesn't make a lot of sense. We see a lot more kind of negativity on the horizon. Um, and then I think a lot of these firms are going to get stuck in window dressing their um, their holdings into the end of the year, right? So if you're, think about this, like, um, a lot of a lot of the investors, uh, fellow investors on this call, a lot of you guys utilize other people's money in your deals. Now imagine for a six month time frame, you weren't delivering the results that everybody else was delivering. Are your investors really going to be happy with you? Or are they going to be super ecstatic with your performance? Probably not. And you're going to have to start putting capital in the markets, whether or not you like it. Uh, and and I, I think that there's a little bit of that going on as well, right? Because a lot of uh, savvy investors, I would say, long-term traders in the markets were looking for a much, well, at least one more leg to the downside, I would say, right? We saw that big correction come Corona. We saw a whip whiplash rally. And then a lot of people were looking for that one more down leg. And Wall Street was sitting on buckets of cash. I was, I was sitting on way too much cash. I'll tell you that right now. I was caught in the mix. I should have at least an extra 80 grand in my account right now. With just the cash I had sitting there on the sideline that I should have deployed, minimum, right? But I got caught in it as well because I'm like, no, nah, I think it got one more leg. And the longer it goes up, the more you start sitting there thinking, okay, maybe it doesn't have one more leg down. Okay, when do I get in? And you see moves like Tesla today going up 12% in a day. And you're like, dang, I wish I owned some more of that. Yeah, I, I uh, would have been nice. So... Uh, I think we're in this divergence where you don't have to think about these companies. Don't even, don't even like think about whether or not they'll be profitable, things like that. Um, I think you got to look at what are the stances of the large uh, like central banks? Are they going to continue like any type of easing if there is any type of reaction? If that's so, then I'm kind of a buyer at least till the end of the year, probably. Um, I'm hoping that we dip so I could get into better prices. Uh, but there's been a massive divergence. And I, I think uh, I, I was reading articles day in, day in um, th this past week about how it's been one of the worst quarters on record for income investors. My, my dividend portfolio is doing nothing for me. I have too much cash doing nothing for me. Just owning these stocks like Coca-Cola, you know, AT&T, Disney, like these great, you know, long-term holds. I've lost money. Right. And then your growth based investments, the things that are hot, a very exciting technology is leading the way. Healthcare is breaking out, um, especially with with thoughts of what's happening with maybe a Corona vaccine, uh, consumer discretionaries. All of those sectors are rallying really hard. Um, so what I would recommend for people that are in the marketplace is, is I it is good to buy just the market. That, that wins over the longest term averages. We all know that. You can go back 200 years, you'll average about 7% annual return, no matter the indice, indice you buy. Um, but I would definitely be looking to rotate some of that cash out of defensive plays into more aggressive plays, probably through the end of the year is my thought process. Come January, come Q4 earnings results uh, that we get out at the end of next year, I do think there will be a little bit of buy the rumor, sell the news of, I don't think Q4 spending will be what people think it'll be. I don't think people will spend on Christmas time like they did last year, the year previous. And I think it'll come out come January in the stock market. Uh, but I think at least for the rest of the year, we got some upside to it. Okay. Well, I will say that I feel smart because I understood about 65, 70% of what you just said. So that's wonderful. I agree with everything I think that you just said. Uh, and by the way, Jake, how old are you? Uh, 25. And when did you start trading? Uh, when I was tw five, five years ago, about. Something mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. he was 20. How many of you guys wish you had started at 20? And he wished he started earlier than that. So you had that. You don't come from money. You don't come from a family that was crazy, entrepreneurs, anything like that. You actually went against their wishes to learn how to trade, correct? 
well, everybody here knows knows no, the situation. Right. People who know know, right? It's why you're here. Let's be honest, right? Like you come to this online meeting because you want to be around other people who think the same way. And it's tough because not everybody you live with, sometimes you surround yourself with, think the exact same way, right? So for sure, the people that I used to surround myself with were not in the same um, kind of way of thinking. But I'll tell you what, they've come around and they've come around, especially nowadays. And, and I will throw out there for those of you that are new to the markets, this is a time of um, exaggerated movement meaning that it's not typical for a stock to jump 15% one day. That's not like the normal day-to-day -day what you can expect over the last 10 years. Uh, so I would definitely say um, be leery of that, right? And be cautious because I can't tell you the amount of friends I've had, you know, that knew nothing and they think that they're rock stars because they'll take three grand and turn it into $13,000 in a matter of two weeks, and then they turn $13,000 into $500 over the next two weeks, right? And I obviously wouldn't want that to happen for anybody here. Uh, but just know, know what you're doing at the end of the day. And I couldn't say that better. It's great when you're surrounded by people. This is such a cool room right now. I'm having like, I'm so, <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm, I'm, touch, I'm such a dork. These are all my friends are my people. And honestly, like Jake, when I called you earlier, earlier today, <clears throat> we were talking about the importance of having people that think like you around because the reason why so many of us in this room have been able to do what it is we're doing during the middle of a global pandemic, during the middle of so much uncertainty is because we were surrounded by each other. So we were able to really grow together, share ideas, uh, share lessons, get things moving in a different direction. And that's why Investor Party has been such a delight, so, such a outlet for the rest of us because we're able to come together uh, be a community and support one another. So guys, I'm so glad you're here. If you're not on Investor Party, go ahead and like our uh, group page on Facebook and come join the party at InvestorParty.com. Come on, babies. We have all sorts of good stuff going up there right now. Now, Emily, Sylvia, will you please translate what the boy Wonder said? You want to go ahead and start or do you want me? I'll start for you. Um, okay. I think what Jake really said in a nutshell is this market truly is something we've never seen before. Um, I've been trading for a little bit longer than Jake. <laughs> um, uh, I've actually been trading for about 23 years. I was 12 when I started. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, but the market, I've seen it go through the tech bubble. I saw it go through the uh, prime bubble, subprime bubble with the real estate in 08, 09. This coronavirus bubble is nothing like any of them have ever been because before on the subprime, before on the tech bubble, news would, would make the stock go up or down. However, we would also see the fundamentals of, those, of the companies move the stock. Now, like if, if an economic report came out in 2008, 2009, the market would jump to what the economic report says. What is the economic report? Economic reports are uh, your job numbers, your, your jobless claims, unemployment claims, um, those type of things. Um, if, if you listen to the unemployment claims now, because we all know the unemployment claims are up here because of the COVID, because of people being on furlough, um, that kind of thing. Job numbers come out, it means absolutely nothing. The market does not react to that news. The market has not reacted. Um, I mean, this is the one I've been following. I don't know if you can if you can see it, if I can pull it up, but this is this is Apple just in the past three, four months. So Apple has been one of my babies. I absolutely love Apple computer. But when you get any kind of news, uh, you know, they're gonna hold putting out their their iPhone or their they're stalling. Normally you would see Apple go down. As you can tell by this little chart, as it's still there. That has not been the case. It has just run up and run up and run up. So you can't, you can't predict what's going to happen by listening to the news. What you can predict and what most people that do trade the markets um, and that have traded the markets is by reading what you're seeing in the charts. And I can't stress enough that learning this 
technical analysis is how you have to trade today. There's no other way to trade. Em, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's, yeah, basically the same thing you said. And what Jake was talking about with the market moving, the way it's been moving, I, you know, I'm only five years uh, old in terms of trading. And Sylvia, you've been trading a, a whole lot longer than we have. But even Jake and I, the reason why we were on the sidelines is because we had never seen um, anything like that. And the way we were taught was, was what Sylvia said, where, you know, the economic news, you know, the markets react to the economic news. So when we first heard about, you know, COVID and the market initially dropped, you know, everybody that's, you know, from that school of how we were taught was expecting it to continue to further go down because nothing good was coming out of the news cycle, right? So for it to kind of like fall the way it fell and then to just now immediately run back up, that was like, okay, well, where did this just come from, right? So even for, you know, newer traders or even, you know, experienced traders like Sylvia, this was something that we had not seen before. So a lot of us were, you know, where we are bullish, you know, we trend with the, with the, we trade with the trend. So even though the market is going up and our bias or our belief is something completely different, you can't, you can't fight against that you have to go by what you see. So if the, if the charts are trending up, we just trade up. But, you know, in the back of our head, there's like, you know, this does not make sense. Like this is all not adding up, but you just trade what you see. And that's kind of like what Jake is talking about is like, you know, but at the same time though, these, these big movements of stocks going up 10%, you know, not just in one day, but it's like 5% today, 3% tomorrow, you know, 12% the next day, usually you don't get that you get a half a percent move you know a day sometimes nothing so for that to continuously happen day after day after day and for this like you know just like it's just going to the moon on type, type, uh, type charts it's you know something that we're not we haven't seen before so we're cautiously still trading up but you know we're just like yeah, yeah but you all you, we have like that yeah but something you know is going to happen but it may not we don't know so so, so i want to just bring up something, okay? Because I have a few more years. <laughs> um, and Emily, I appreciate, and Sylvia, I appreciate what you're saying about we haven't seen this happen before, but the reality is we have, and we haven't just seen it in this, the stocks recently, okay? So this is exactly 2008, but it's a different bubble. And Sylvia, I appreciate the fact you said it's a bubble, because it is. As a realtor, and I was a realtor in 2008, you know, I started in 96. Um, it's one of the reasons I stepped away in 2005 for a while. I got a, re a regular nine to five job because of my guilt of selling to a buyer, seeing what I was seeing, knowing that it was going to crash in a, in a couple of years. I knew people were going to lose at least 30% on the value of their houses. They lost sometimes 50 if they bought at the high end, right? Um, and a lot of it had to do with the same kind of stuff. I was in tune to what was happening in the market and the appraisers were appraising up houses at 15% a month. So you're seeing the same thing in the stock market and you're, you're, you're great, you're riding it. You know, I'm in crypto, sorry. <laughs> because it doesn't make sense. So all I can say to that, and it, please correct me if I'm wrong, is you know, don't risk any more than you can afford to lose because at some point the bubble will break. You know, it will burst. I've been through since, I, I mean, not that I'm that old, but I've been aware of these bubbles since 1974. You know, and um, I, it's, it's sad to watch how it cycles and every time it cycles, I'm always saying after it busts, okay, where's the next one going to occur? And what part of, you know, it's always going to be financial in some way, but you know, like the dot-com, I, I knew people making a lot of money with that. And it was like uh, smoke, smoke and mirrors. And I said, how are people making, you know, a million dollars? They're getting buyouts of, of 10 million. I know people personally, that was in the 20 years ago and they're still living off that money. And it's like, it was smoke and mirrors. <laughs> well, and, and one thing I, I'd, I'd like to just kind of point out about, because I agree, I think bubbles happen and they'll continue to happen. And there's a lot of data on that. You can go back hundreds of years, right? You can go back and study like the tulip craze or it doesn't even matter the product set. 
uh, it's it's very easy to analyze that. I think what's maybe interesting nowadays is the speed. That's what I'm taking away is maybe what's changed. Because if you even look all the way back to subprime, which happened pretty quick in most people's eyes, it was still about a year top to bottom on the market, stock market that is, and you fell 50%. Here we fell 34% in a month. So if you just kind of like compare that for a second, right? It took all year long to go 50%. And then from there, it took you another couple years to get back. We went down one month, back one month like that, which is interesting to say the least, right? Um, and I would definitely say that, like you were saying, you know, uh, maybe kind of reiterate your point of don't risk more than you're willing to lose. Have trailing stop losses. Have uh, buy some portfolio insurance, right? If you've doubled the asset value on your shares, sell a third of it. You know, use that to buy some insurance contracts against the rest of your portfolio. Like, there's a lot that you can do to mitigate risk. Don't give it all back, right? You should have made a little bit on the drop and made some more on the pop, um, but don't don't let it all kind of run away again because we're seeing it move really fast. So it's not going to give you a lot of time to react, right? Corona was a one month time for 33 days top to bottom on the S&P 500, right? If you would have waited an extra two weeks, you missed half of it, right? So this is not a time to kind of sit on your hands. Uh, so I, I, I agree with you though. It's, this is nothing new. It just seems to be moving faster than we've seen. So you guys have mentioned something that's really interesting. So I'm going to, I'm going to back this up for people like me who might need a little bit of um, rudimentary 101 stock market analysis. So uh, let's talk about something that's actually interesting, that, which is gonna give you guys an idea of where this kind of injury plays out. So go with me. Uh, I'm gonna pass the reins on shortly, so you have to. So what you've heard uh, Jake talk about this a second ago, the tulip craze. Now, what does that mean? Well, that's a great question, especially if you've never even heard of it. Well, the tulip craze happened in 1637. It was, it, it was a Dutch phenomenon where it was the first uh, speculative bubble. What that means is like a bulb, a tulip bulb, a simple tulip bulb you guys can buy at Home Depot or Walmart now and you plant it correctly and underground and it starts to root in spring and oh no, all these great flowers. Well, the Dutch love their gardens, right? So they were going from buying these tulip bulbs where they started breeding some really pretty bulbs right, some really pretty tulips. So the price of these bulbs are going up and up and they started to become this asset, if you would. And people were spending a, a exorbitant amounts on these tulips. I believe the most expensive price involved some sort of like, it, it had like, a cat, like some cattle attached to it and some land, it was a ridiculous amount for one tulip bulb. And then it crashed overnight. Because let's be honest, it was a damn flower. Okay, so here it is, it's this thing that people wanted, they were emotionally attached to it, they were spending ridiculous amounts of money for what's essentially like one step away from a salad ingredient, and then, boom, so people woke up and it was worth nothing. So that man got rid of a horse and his daughter and maybe part of a castle just because he wanted to have a salad flower, right? So it's... It's a different thing to think about. So that was, that was a speculative bubble. They thought it was going to go up and up and up and did not do anything. Now, the difference with the tulip, uh, the tulip craze in, in the 1600s, it actually didn't do anything to affect the GDP, the gross domestic, the gross domestic product of the Netherlands. It did, no, it did not affect it whatsoever. Now, the bubbles are so tied to our economies, they are really an indicator of what the pulse of the economy is and what's going on. So when you hear us talk about the tech bubble in the 90s, uh, I was a kid during that point. So like thousand people were starting, like AOL was new, everything was so new, everything was so fast. And when you went from dial-up internet to DSL, oh my God, you were rolling in it, right? Now DSL stands for something completely different. No, I'll keep my mouth shut on that one. Anyway, and then it can technology kept advancing. So then you have the, talk, the, stock, the tech bubble pop, uh, and that's when, like, Nelson's talked about that before, how it was hard to get a job during a period of time like that. Then you had the housing bubble. You've, we've had multiple housing bubbles. You've had oil and gas bubbles. You've had um, different tech sectors have bubbles, medical sectors. It's, it's crazy. They all grow. Remember, they're all organisms. If you think about the markets, 
All right, we talk about markets, there are multiple markets. You have a real estate market, stock market, futures com market, commodities. I'm, I don't do that side, I do, I do my side. I do real estate, I'm good at real estate, I stay in my lane, right? But there are other markets that work together. And the thing that's interesting is how they all relate. So coming together to talk about how they relate is what we're gonna be doing this next week. What do you need to look for in real estate and how does it tie into stocks and vice versa? For example, Pam made a comment in the chat box to me talking about the last time they saw these 15% increases in a day were the same times we saw 15% increases in appraisal values for real estate. They were divorced from reality, but they were doing the same thing. For some reason though, right now, Historically, the stock market and the real estate market kind of parallel each other as they go somewhere. But recently, it looks like there might be a divorce between the stock and the real estate markets. Sylvia, Emily, Jake, what do you guys make of that? Okay, I'm sorry. I was reading the chats that were coming into me. What was the question again? I apologize. The, the fact that the stock market and the real estate market seem to be divorcing from each other, although they're still not married to reality. Really? So, I, I see everything going up. I don't know where, where you're seeing, like the real estate market here in Northern Virginia, like I had a friend of mine, his house sold 10% over asking in nine hours. Like that's what I'm seeing in Annandale, Virginia, they're selling 60, 65,000 over asking, like it's hot. It is, and, and stocks are hot. I mean, I see everything going up. Um, I think partly driven by interest rates, right? I mean, I my parents, I'm helping them. We're actually just finalized the contract today. They're buying a new property. They qualified on a second mortgage, no points down, uh, 2.625% interest rate. Freaking ridiculous if you ask me, right? That's cheap money, right? They're just throwing money at people. Like, here you go, you know, money to the world. Um, I think it's inflating everything. I think real estate's driven a little bit more by the Corona scare. I think people are realizing they need more space if their kids are gonna be home all the time and they're gonna be home all the time there might be something happening there as well. Um, maybe, maybe not. That's purely speculation on my end, but I see all markets heating. Like, like you look at stock prices up. I mean, in general, right? Like, of course you could find some losers inside there. Real estate market I'm seeing rather hot. Um, gold prices are going up. I think one thing that I was, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. He works for risk mitigation at, at a big top 10 bank. And um, his biggest fear right now is inflation. His biggest thought process is he's worried about having too much cash on the sidelines and being left out in the cold. When they're pumping so much funny money in the system, you were making a joke earlier, it seems like money's made out of bubblegum these days, right? They just, just stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it until it like maybe one day breaks, maybe not, right? And we, we created this game for ourselves. Um, that might be part of it as well, right? It's, it's a lot of the traditional correlations um, that you would expect to be holding aren't necessarily there. Um, and I think the best thing people can have in their, their life right now, besides cash enough to be able to, to weather any storm, I'm a believer in that, but not too much, own some assets. Everything's going up, like literally. Um, and as long as you got some sort of protection mechanism online, like, I mean, for, for tangible, real hard data for people, if you own stocks, put at least say a 10% trail stop on it. Pretty simple. If you don't know how to do it, call up your broker. They'll, they'll do it for you. They might charge you like 40 bucks, but they'll do it for you, right? It means if it goes down 10%, it automatically sells, right? You're not going to be down into another Corona. It's down massively, right? I would argue maybe that's a better time to buy, but you know, but just don't like, as long as you have some sort of protection in place, you'll be okay. Um, I, what I love about the stock market is such a liquid product set, right? You know, in real estate, I always think about the heavy exit costs, the slow transaction to move. You got to do that. Like if you got $250,000 in stock and you need to sell it tomorrow because, oh no, I ran out of money. I need cash. Okay. Sell it today. I'll have cash in hand by the end of the week. That's, that's not a big deal. Right. Um, but make sure your capital is in a place that it's growing. I think that's important these days and just play the market you're given. You know, like I don't like how the game was played and a lot of, like I have a few students in this chat. Um, I used to complain all the time when I would do my, my long three-day classes. I don't like the game. I hate the rules. I don't like how we designed it, but they didn't give me that choice. I didn't get to choose how, like, how, what's going on in the world. I can't make markets move in the way that they're moving, right? I would have preferred the stock market to keep crashing, the Federal Reserve do nothing. I would have I loved 60% off of all-time highs before we saw another rally. That would have been my ideal world, 
right? I have cash on hand, buy everything super cheap, right? I would have been stoked. I didn't get to pick it, right? I got to work inside the little framework that I got and make the next right move, right? And, and I think that's kind of like my mantra um, is always just make the next right move, whatever that means is kind of how I like to look at trading and investing, right? Whatever that looks like at that moment, because um, we weren't even thinking about things like Corona at the end of last year right? Not even on my radar, personally. Maybe it was on yours. You were ahead of me on that in that regard. But just constantly making that next right move and having people to keep you in check. I called up Emily today because I was pissed when I saw Tesla this morning and I felt like I didn't own enough Tesla and it was already up 13%. And I'm like, I want to pick up a few more shares, Em. And she can talk me off the ledge so I'm not emotional about it, right? So I have people there to kind of keep you in check. Uh, and Speaking of Tesla, what do you guys think about what it can someone please explain the phenomenon that is Tesla? Like, what the is going on? That's what we're talking I'm about. Explain, I understand what it was. I'm not going to explain it. Yeah, you can, Em, but I'll tell Jake, it's pulling back now, so you can still get in. <laughs> I know. Oh, I can always get back in. But I'm <laughs> saying have somebody there to keep you from getting emotional in this game is very, it's, 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 it's beneficial, absolutely. to say the least. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you Fun can talk to back in at any time. So can someone please explain this, uh, what, what you're getting back into with Tesla? Uh, in my honest opinion, I'll, I'll throw my two cents out there. It's just, a, it's a solid short squeeze at the moment. Tesla for the longest time was one of the most heavily shorted stocks in the entire stock market. They've produced like a profit, I think three quarters. Right. Like, like it's, they don't make money, right. It's all this hype and super excited. You know, Elon's going to change the world, right. He's going to, uh, he's going to put rocket ships everywhere. He's going to fly our cars and it'll be like the Jetsons. Right. Cool. If I could buy Elon, I'd buy Elon. They don't sell Elon. I have to buy Tesla. And I think what's happening is that all the fanboys bid it up high enough that a lot of the short sellers are like, okay, how high is this going? I, I'd hate to be a short seller right now. Oh my gosh. And in this move, which means they profit, by the way, if I have to define uh, concepts here, uh -huh. they make money uh -huh. on prices going down. So every time it goes up, they're losing more and more and more money. At a certain point, people say, I'm done. I can't handle this anymore. And the way they get out is they buy, which makes it look like more demand. And then it feeds into the narrative of, oh, look, it's continuing to go up. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's this weird feedback loop of short sellers buying to close and fanboys buying to open because they, they think that the closing transactions are an increase in demand, is my personal two cents. Ladies? It's exactly what we talked about this morning with Jake. So, you know, it's, it's just that. And then there's, you know, and then you have that all the fan base as well. So you have the short sellers. What is this yeah. fan base? Like, is this like in, in my world is, are you saying thin, fam? Like fan, like, you know, fan base. like they're fans of Tesla, like the people oh, who are Tesla, like okay. nothing can ever go wrong. You know, we're just, you know, they just believe in everything that, you know, Tesla is all about. So they're always then adding to their positions as it goes you know, as it, as it goes higher or just brand new people who are just like, you know what, enough of this. I keep trying to get it when it's at a low price. I'm just going to jump in. So you have a, a whole mixture of all of that. And that's, you know, to me, that's what it looks like. I don't, I can't explain why else it, it's, it's going up. It's not like, you know, I, I don't know. There's no other way to explain it, but, but that, but um, you know, it's, 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 they make good cars, you know? So I want to throw some out there as a takeaway, though, for everybody listening. The really cool part about these markets for a new trader is that you don't have to go super leveraged in your positions or shoot super short on your time frames to get good results. Like, it's not typical that you would have, like, so if you look at the stock market in general, 10% annual growth is the expectation. If you're seeing 10% weekly growth, right? You could just go and slow down your type of investing. You don't need to day trade. You don't need to buy today, sell tomorrow. You could do like weekly stuff and monthly stuff and be generating returns that typically were yearly type of investing. So I think for, for anybody that's just trying to get into it, doing like, you know, even monthly trades, you know, just slow it down. Don't, don't, you don't need options really right now because they're moving so much. Um, you don't need a lot of margin behind you. Um, you can still make decent returns just because typically when stocks are moving only half a percent 
like literally nothing, that's when you need to use leverage in order to amplify results to make any type of meaningful returns. Right now, when it's going 10%, you can make that same return without any leverage, which is probably the better thing to do when you're new anyways. What's interesting is like, um, Elon did something really kind of interesting. I think it was, where was I? I was at a, I was staying politely at home for an entire quarantine. I haven't left my house ever. I only go from here to the bathroom. I never do anything fun. So, but if I were dreaming and I went somewhere, it would have been two weeks ago on a Sunday. And it would have been to a friend's house with another friend anyway. And she might have read something in my dream about um, Elon selling shares in something. Uh, and it was for, I think it was a hundred million. And he put 60 million into SpaceX, 30 million into Tesla, and 10 million into something that else that he's doing because it's Elon Musk. And he had to borrow money for rent. This, by the way, is the seventh wealthiest person in the world. Elon Musk is the seventh wealthiest person and he had to borrow money for rent. Now, one of the things I wanna point out here, which is brilliant, okay, for those of you who don't know, for the, when you sell something, like when you sell a stock or even a house, whatever, the minute you receive profits, it's called constructive receipt, all right? It means uh, that's what your capital gain is based on, right? That is what you're taxed on. If you touch that money, if you take it, okay? Now, when you're dealing with funds that are that large, there are different financial strategists who typically have doctorates in finance that can help you mitigate a lot of that. Lot of that. But what Elon did by putting all of those funds, $100 million profit, and putting it into those three different companies, he didn't have to pay tax on any of it because he didn't touch it. He reinvested it. This is why we talk about when you're an investor and you think on the right side of the quadrant, whether you're a business owner or an investor, you can pay less taxes or no taxes if done correctly. So that being said, why is it every, so I want everybody else's feedback on this. Do you believe, this is gonna be a little challenging and yes, Emily, I'm gonna make you say something. <gasps> Do you believe that it is fair or unfair that the average American loses about 40% of their salary to taxes. And why? Class, defend. Um, well, it always, always goes back to what? To education, right? Knowing how to benefit from what is out there. Like Jake said earlier, you know, we didn't make the rules to the game, right? We're just kind of like thrown in here and we just, you know, we, we take what we know and, and we use it to the best of our ability. So, um, you know, lack of financial education, uh, whether it's learning how to invest or taking advantage of the taxes or anything else in, in life that is available and pretty much accessible to everybody. It's just that some people lack that. Um, they don't, they don't, they, they, it was never taught to them or they don't know how to access that information is, is key. So yeah, whether it's fair or not fair that the rules are the rules, um, you know, you just have to be able to take advantage of whatever's out there for you and apply it to, to, to what benefits you and your family. So um, is it fair? I don't, I don't know. It's not, I don't think it's fair, but you know, there are ways to, um, to take advantage so that you're not paying 40% of, you know, of taxes. Well said, Sylvia. There's no reason that you should pay such high exuberant amount of taxes. Um, and you guys know in the real estate realm, get yourself structured properly. And that's the same way in the stocks when you're doing stocks. Get yourself structured properly. Build a business around what you're doing. Every single one of us are going to have to pay our taxes. We all have to pay our dues. But let's just pay what we have to and our own fair share versus the 30, 35, 40, 45, 80% that some people are paying over taxes for sure.
I think that's absolutely key that you're saying, your fair share. Most Americans, most people don't realize that they have control over what their fair share is. And they also, if you were like me, and most of you are, when you were born, you had no idea that the, that the dollar, it felt like this ethereal thing that was out there and out of your control, not something that you had complete control over. That's a process of understanding that money is an idea and what you do with it matters. How you grow it matters. So understanding that money is a currency, it's an energy, it's something that you can actually create with knowledge, produce something that has value to other people, that changes what your concept of money is. For example, uh, stocks. You can't see them, you can't touch them, you can't feel them. You get a paper certificate or you get a digital certificate of some sort and it's held in your brokerage account. But they have value. So something that is intangible has value. Meanwhile, people get so concerned when they have a dollar in their hand, they have to spend it because they can see and touch it, they're emotionally attached. But you don't make money holding on to paper dollars, especially now when they're just made out of, well, let's just say we had a toilet paper shortage earlier and I use a couple of singles. But you wanna also understand that when you have an idea, that is money. Think of it as like this way, Tesla again. Elon Musk had an idea about creating a better car and about putting people into space on Mars. And he had an idea. And that's made him the seventh richest man on earth, even asking for rent. It's an idea. It's a product. You don't have to go by what the dollar, just a green dollar for you. Understanding what those assets are will help you find some liberation from it, but you have to divorce yourself from the emotion. Am I making sense when I say that? I hope I am. I, th I think most of us are on the same page there, Jacob. I think the faster you can push your money away from you, the better off you are. That's just a tool that I try to do all the time. Like January 1, max out the IRA. Like, don't even think about it. Just do it, right? You know, push it away from you. Get it away from your spendable account into places where it's locked up. You have a certain amount of capital, stick it in a property. Once money is in real estate, it's tax advantage to stay in real estate into perpetuity. You're just going to 1031 that baby till you die, right? So, so you just, once it's there, it's incentivized to stay there, right? It doesn't matter what product set you put it into. I think the, the faster you just push more of your capital away from you, that's what I've always done. I keep $1 in my bank account, like my checking account, and I have a checking line of credit that goes negative when I pay bills if I, if I ever need to. And I never put money in there because I, know, I don't want to think like I have money, right? You know, I put it in my brokerage account. I go buy a gold bar, you know, I'll go put it in my real estate business. But the faster I push it away from myself, like the better off I am long term. Because I do think of ways to spend that money. I see $100. I'm like, oh, I can go do this. I haven't broken that habit yet. So I just push it away from me. And maybe eventually I'll get that good. What's also really interesting what you talked about inflation a second ago and what that means. So I want to actually talk about inflation if we can. Uh, Emily and I have had this, this discussion a couple times, but I, for those people, because not everybody on this call or on Facebook are educated investors. They, there are a couple of people who are brand new. So um, what we're going to talk about is inflation and why we like to know what banks are doing. So let's say you have $100. And that could buy you 50 cups of coffee. Awesome. Now, as time goes on, you have 50, bucks, 50 cups of coffee that you can purchase with $100. But guess what? We're going to increase our inflation. So now the dollar is worth less. That same $100 can now only buy you 25 cups of coffee. It's the same $100 to you, but inflation is an invisible tax that takes away your purchasing power. That's what people don't realize. That's something I'm trying to get people to see when they're talking about real estate right now, how prices aren't dropping. And you're right, prices aren't dropping, but the purchasing power of your dollar to buy those properties is dropping. And it's very under the water. If people can't see it, they're not gonna make a fuss. If they don't understand that the dollar is being devalued by all this constant fake printing, then they're not going to scream or whine. They're gonna believe in the government. And they're not gonna notice as they slowly take away all of your rights. But we're gonna save that for another conversation. 
the thing you do to combat inflation is to preserve your purchasing power. Now, I know how I do it. I like tangible assets. I like real estate. I like gold and silver physicals. And I actually really am interested in uh, oil and gas, which has been fascinating to watch recently. But there are ways to preserve your purchasing power in the stock market. Uh, Sylvia, how do you preserve your purchasing power in the stock market? Sylvia? Emily? My internet's bumping in my, my internet's bumping in and out here a little bit. Um, question again, I'm sorry. How do you preserve your purchasing power in the stock market to combat inflation? Um, well, you, you've got to keep that money moving. You've got to keep investing it. If you just set it in cash, you're not making any money from that money. So, you know, like I showed you on that little screen with Apple Computer, you know, and what Jake was saying, you know, buy some silver, buy some gold. Put money in things that will move, that will give you better purchasing power with what you have. Because a dollar truly isn't just a dollar. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I'm reinvesting. Mm -hmm. Emily, what do you do? Uh, pretty much what, what Sylvia said, you have to have your money in circulation, right? Anything, any money that's just sitting there stagnant, not... I always call it not giving birth to new money is you might as well just go dump it in like, you know, the closest river or lake that you have in your in your area. Right. Um, so it's always a matter of getting that money out in circulation to, you know, to to give you at least another dollar. So for every dollar I have out there in circulation, I, I needed to at least bring me back another dollar, if not more. Um, but I, again, obviously, you know, making sure that you have money saved up for emergencies and all the other stuff. But outside of that. Um, you know, if it's not out there circulating, at least to cover inflation, then you're losing. I agree to that. Jake? I, I don't think you got to make it so complicated. It's just ownership of assets, right? So stocks have performed on, on a, uh, an inflation-adjusted basis um, above every other asset class over the longest time horizons, right? I mean... You know, technically gold and silver underperform because of storage costs. Real estate over the longest periods of time pegged to close to inflation minus maintenance and repairs. Obviously it inflates of, of, uh, up and down around that line. Um, but it's just own them. Like don't make it so hard. Just own, like buy Amazon when it was 2000 a share and it's 3300 right? I mean, people have done that. Like so a lot of wealth can be created just through the ownership of assets. Um, you know, somebody once told me, and I, I kind of stole this line from them, they said, inflation is the, the hidden tax on the people, right? It usually starts with the basement of currency, right? And it's just that little way for them to kind of have that little hidden tax on you. So you got to do every single thing you can do to try to plug up that hole in that boat and be able to outperform. Now, I think the, one of the best ways to do it, like what Emin Sylvia was saying, is I think step one is own an asset, whether you buy a house, you buy a gold bar, you buy stocks. I don't care. Just buy something, right? A financial asset where most people would agree that you define a financial asset is something that you purchase where you intend to sell it again for a potential profit, right? Um, purchase. Step two is cash flow that asset. Now, that takes a little bit higher skill set. Many of the investors in this room probably do that with real estate all the time. But I think that's a higher level. That's like step two level, level two investing is that you can then take that cash flow, you can reinvest, you can start doing stuff and compounding on top of that. In stocks, you do that with covered calls. You buy it, you buy the asset, you sell options against it. It's kind of like doing lease options on your stock. Um, but creating some sort of income generating off of asset ownership uh, would be probably one of the best answers I can come up with. How difficult or not difficult is it to get started learning how to trade? I, I mean, how long does it take you to open up your computer and just fill out a five, five minute questionnaire to open up an account? Now, do you know everything at that point? No, but you can start the process. So if you're just saying get started, it's pretty simple. To be proficient and effective is a different answer, right? A lot of people, like, it's not that hard to go out there and buy a home. Well, that's maybe questionable. I give it that depending on the market you're in. Um, but to be really great at it, it's a different story. But I, I think it's, I mean, most people already do it. This is what fascinates me all the time is it's like, 
What, what do you mean learn how to do it? You either own it in your IRA, your 401k, your 403b, your 401a, your TSP, your life insurance policy that is somehow tied and or pegged to a market-based product, right? You're already in it, right? Like the more you know about a concept, the more effective you can be. Just like with real estate, right? You know, like I've, I've gone through countless trainings where they just say, you know how to run a deal five different directions, right? Just in case you get stuck one way, move, shift. As the market shifts on you, maybe you thought it was a flip. Oh my gosh, I can't sell in this market. Maybe now it's a rental, right? Understanding how to ebb and flow can make you more effective. Um, but I, I would just say, just get involved. I, I think anybody can do it. Everybody should. Because my, my, my 19-year-old sister, she buys and sells stocks all the time. I mean, from their phone or iPhone. While she's sitting watching her online college classes, and she's like, what should I buy right now? And I'm like, well, look at these. And you just click on your phone. Hey, anybody can do this. That's actually the interesting thing. Uh, this is literally an asset class you can do from anywhere. And we're learning that in Real Estate Survivor. People are learning to invest in other markets outside of their own. And we've actually made it an entire challenge, which has been fascinating to watch. Now, with Stock Survivor, when we talk about, and we've all talked about this before, a diverse portfolio means you have more than just one asset class. When you are diversified, it means you are in multiple markets simultaneously because as one's going down, there's usually always an inverse reaction where something's going up. So just as of what Jake was talking about uh, with the dollar, as the dollar's being devalued, gold and silver have been going up. So they're an inverse relationship. That's why you want to have a percentage of your uh, portfolio in tangibles, physicals, okay? So that's one thing that we want to get going. Now, if you're like me and you need stocks broken down into like a kindergarten level to understand, okay, this is what I'm looking at, this is why, and this is how it plays in, well, then you're going to be able to keep asking questions to Jake, Emily, and Sylvia because they're going to be here to actually help us all as we go through Stock Survivor. Guys, do you have any questions you want to ask Emily, Jake, or Sylvia? Or comments, request the chef. Do you want to talk about Jake's beard? That's always been interesting. When does Stock Survivor start? That's a great question. Elise isn't here. We are actually um, working on it right now. Uh, Emily, how do you feel right now? You want to talk? We're, we're cool. working on it. <laughs> My goal. So at least and I, at least and I uh, are setting up a meeting to uh, probably today or tomorrow to start the process and 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 you know kind of get that ball rolling. But it's coming soon. I've already started the ball rolling. Just FYI, I started making the phone calls, getting all these bitches together, and telling what I wanted to do. Starting the Brit, the, oh, the yes, platform what we're doing. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, hey. Yeah. So um, <laughs> last time I had this idea, real estate survivor was born, and had we just kept talking about it, nothing would have happened, right? So we're doing stock survivor in two weeks. So we're gonna what's make gonna happen, it happen is that at the end of this week, we're going to make the announcement. Next week, people have the chance to go <laughs> to the form online. They can enroll and see what's going on. The first stock survivor is going to be at a low cost because we still have to pay for their time. So we are charging for stock survivor for the first time. But then after this, after this trial period, after our first experiment, we are going to be at that point further down the road with Investor Party and people will be paying for more. So you want to get in on this while it's going to be in his beta testing phase, uh, we can actually learn from Emily, Sylvia, Jake, and maybe some other people that we are working on. Then pay attention. We're gonna we're gonna post the link on Friday. By the way, at least we're posting a link on Friday, and um, we're gonna make sure that can all get going throughout the weekend. So Emily and I have got a lot of work to do. We're bringing Jake and Sylvia on for the ride. Awesome. Um, there was one thing else I wanted to mention. Hold on. I forgot. Can oh, I yeah. add something, Jacob? So we are using, Never mind. You <laughs> right. For those of you who are not, who have not followed what we're doing with our nonprofit, with Sherlock's Homes, uh, we are actually teaching a 25-year-old Black American, that's what he likes to be called, young man, my little Matthew. He is now unemployed thanks to COVID and has been homeless for seven years. We are teaching him how to trade. He got a $600 tax return. That's all the money he has to his name. So we are going to be showing him how to grow these funds and we're going to be documenting it the entire way. If he can do it, and he will do it. Why? Because he trusts us and the process and our vision. If he can do it, 
then why the hell can't any of us? So, be ready to go. Stop thinking it's above you and get on the bandwagon because as you can see, apparently the wagon's only going up, up, up. Anyway, so just be prepared for that. What other questions do you guys have for the team? I just wanted to throw out there, Jacob, that I think stocks for a real estate investor, because I used to have these conversations all the time who people are primary real estate, which I love, um, is it's a great place to turn your cash, turn and burn your cash. So if you have an extra 10 G's and you can't put it in the next property yet, but you want to grow the 10 to a 20 and you just cycle the money over onto itself in a rather liquid product set, that's where I see it as a very good fit. Even if it's not a primary, it's a great place just to turn money. I can live with that. And actually, in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki talks about when he was uh, actually sold a property, he put into his stock because it made 7.5%. As opposed to keeping in the bank, making none while he's finding his next asset. So it's very important to understand how they work, to so have a working knowledge so your power team can work with you. Yes, your stock broker should be on your power team. If you're not running it yourself, have a qualified professional running your money for you. And actually, class, Sylvia, Jake, Emily, how would you quantify? How would you qualify a, a quality broker? Not Robin Hood. Okay, uh, that's fine. keep going. Yeah, so uh, more than that, um, any of the large major firms that you feel comfortable with uh, holding your capital, right? So if you go, I, I used to send all my students to a, um, an, a publication called Barron's, B-A-R-R-O-N-S. They used to, and they still do, every single year they review all the online brokers. So if you type in Barron's Online Broker Review onto Google, it'll come back with like a third party independent research firm. You know, they're, they're uh, like a financial news outlet and they'll say, these people are best for this. These people are best for this. These people are best for this. Um, you know, I, I don't think that there's a perfect broker is what you'll find in the industry. Uh, a lot of people who have larger amounts of capital, I'd say a hundred grand plus, a lot of times you'll find them at interactive brokers because you get the best margin rates. You're going to get um, best uh, just return on idle cash, but their software looks like it was made in 1970. It's kind of clunky, you know, it's not ideal, but I mean, it's pretty good. You'll find a lot of traders at TD Ameritrade, um, not the best margin rates, a little bit higher commissions, even though commissions are practically negligible these days. Um, you got to make sure you fill out the paperwork correctly to get the right privileges, but that's a pretty big brokerage firm a lot of, a lot of people end up with. Uh, there are some other ones like Fidelity and E-Trade. I would just say, if you research them, you'll find that not every brokerage firm does every product set, meaning like if you start with just stock and options and you know that's all you want to do, pretty much anything works. If you start saying, I want to get fancy with futures to hedge your gold portfolio, like I do, I got enough money in gold that when, when it falls in value, it, it affects me that I want to go into the futures market and use a gold contract to hedge that risk, right? So even if you aren't using it to actively trade, you can use it to just kind of baseline your portfolio. Um, you're going to need certain brokers that are a little bit more full service, uh, like a TD Ameritrade, like a Fidelity probably. Um, but again, if you do a little bit research, they're all the same. They're all good enough and there's no perfect one out there. Just not, not Robin hood, not, not like, not, not an app you download. Uh, cause what you'll find is you'll get frustrated with the tools they offer. That's the biggest thing. The only difference between brokers these days, now that commissions have went away is tools. So software analysis tools, like how good is their charting? How good are their scanners? How good is their risk analysis uh, component to their software? And then secondly is education. So some of these big bigger firms, they'll have little mini videos, like what is a stock? What is an option? You know, and they're kind of cute and they're animated and the stock dances on the screen and it kind of defines it for you. That's cool. Right. But that's a, a value that they can offer. And besides that, in my opinion, they're practically all the same. You guys want to add you know what I love, Jake, is you dance the same way in person as your stock does across the screen. That was very amusing. I got minimal skill sets. Dancing, not, not, not necessarily high on that list. Yeah. I got your back, boo-boo. I can teach you a thing or two, other Jacob. It's fine. I taught you how to dress.
It's true. I, I had Jacob as my mentor. He gave me a few pointers. And it's remarkable what you can do with just a few guidelines, right? Yeah. He gave me some rules to live by, certain patterns, color, texture, mixtures. And man, it, it's done wonders. Yeah. Having a mentor is key. Having a mentor is key. That's right. If you want help dressing, I'm still available for those of you who actually want to you know, do something. Today's just an easy day. I'm not even wearing pants. Anyway, Sylvia, Emily, what do you guys have? What are some final, like, what are some final thoughts you want to tell people? Because we're going to be talking about this for the next few days on, uh, on, on Investor Party. What are some things you want people to like, start looking at today just to have conversations rolling? Um, well, I think that the, the number one thing is, you know, does this even interest you, right? It, do you even want to learn how to trade? Because not, it's it's not for everybody, right? It's real estate. Some people prefer to do real estate. Some people prefer to do uh, stock trading. Some people prefer to do both. The question to ask yourself is, is this for me? Do I see myself wanting to do this? That's the one thing I always ask people is, um, don't don't focus on how difficult you think it might be just ask yourself whether you see yourself doing this, whether you want to do it and whether you want to do it now, right? So if all those are yeses, then the rest of the stuff comes easy because you have people that are, you know, obviously going to come in line to walk you through that whole process, right? So the, the, the one thing you just need to ask yourself is, do you, do you see yourself doing this? Do you want to do this? And do you want to do this now? If that's, if all those are yeses, all the pieces to the puzzle get, get, Put together eventually and all the answers will come and what sounded difficult today will be easy peasy in, in three months when you're talking about you know technical analysis and looking at candlesticks and looking at chart prices and looking at ticker symbols all those things will come into place um, just you know be patient with yourself and just understand that you're learning something new and that takes time just like anything else you know but as long as you're patient patient with yourself you're asking questions you're participating you're doing your part you know the the people that are you know helping you along the way will will be there to you know push you if we have to a little bit to motivate you a little bit i mean it's it's not you know it's not um something that just happens overnight but it, once you get it, it's something that you'll, it's a, it's a skill set you're going to have for the rest of your life and nobody can ever take that away from you. I love that. You know, it's actually interesting because it's the stuff you don't know that's really the most valuable. Like when I, um, you're, you're going to come across life tragedies, guys. Someone's going to pass away or lose a job or cars going to break down. It'd be something as simple as that. But it's interesting to see what this knowledge of understanding how intangible assets work and tangible assets being real estate is through financial knowledge how it really impacts everything in your life and you can create solutions where without them otherwise you would have been completely lost um and i I'll sh i've shared that story before with you guys about how um when i lost my relationship that day i went out and bought a house using my own money and my own credit i didn't know i could do that i always heard i could i thought i could but then i tested it but it was having the ability to go out and do that, right? That's kind of cool, badass. Thing. Yeah, I did that um, without even really thinking. I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I knew what I was doing at the time, but I, I couldn't tell you how I did it. I was in a fog, but I did it. I relied on my training. And you're gonna find that even here. All of us have had those conversations where it's like, okay, mom needs to go into a nursing home. How are we gonna to afford to do it? Well, most people are kind of screwed. They take, they pull their money from family and friends try to get mom into a nursing home. But if you know, okay, She's gonna, we gotta make $1,000 extra a month to make sure we can get her into a quality nursing home where she's affording. Okay, I'm gonna buy these stocks as a cash flowing asset. I'm gonna offset them with these other practices and insurances. And we're gonna put mom here and we know that her at least her bills are covered until we do X, Y, and Z. You see what I'm saying? So you get these options where people wouldn't have otherwise known. And you don't have to know everything. You don't have to know everything to be, to be effective at all. Like you really don't, 80% is plenty. So like Sylvia, for example, is one of my favorite traders. She's brilliant. She's been doing it long enough to where if I have any doubt, I go to her. She calls me about mobile homes. Cool, I'll help you up. What do you want to know, right? <laughs> so like, Sylvia, what, what are some things you want to tell people? Well, that's one of the things that I found. Um, you know, you have so many different things in real estate. You've got lease options, you've got rentals, you've got buy and hold, you've got fix and flip. And the same with the stock market. There are so many different ways to invest, but you don't need to know them all. And kind of like Emily was saying, you're learning something new, but take it one step at a time. Invest in a stock. And then learn a little bit about options. And then learn a little bit about cash flow on stocks you already own in your IRA or your 401k.
but take it little step at a time and start creating that cash flow on a, on a month by month basis. Uh, and the beautiful thing about the market, and I'm sure that you heard Jake say it, but if you're brand new in the market, you probably, it probably didn't make sense. When I first started trading the market, if our markets moved 10% in a year, we were lucky. Today, we'll see 10% in a day, 10% in a week, 10% in a month. They're moving so much faster. So it doesn't matter when you start, what matters is you start. Get a little bit of foundation under you and you'll be amazed at how much you just rock it with it. Yeah, I love the quote from uh, Gary Vaynerchuk that says, most people think that, they, um, that they're behind the game, behind the game. But the reality of the kid is most people aren't even playing. So how are you supposed to win the game if you're not getting off the sidelines? Uh, guys, hope you found this interesting. We're going to be doing more of this throughout this week. We're also going to be having um, Chicago IRA Club coming on, talking about how to use your, uh, your, uh, your retirement accounts in order to invest in stocks, different things you can do with them, uh, as well as how you diversify. Like You should have real estate. You should have stocks. They're not, we're not saying one is better than the other. We're saying that they work together. So that's what we're trying to get you guys to see and accomplish. Um, they we're also going to be having other panels that come through this so people can start understanding. I do want to talk on Wednesday about, well, what are the different assets and trading styles within uh, stocks? Like, what are, what are options trading? What is Forex? What, how do you do all sorts of things? What is paper trading versus actually trading? You know, things that we want to make 101 that we can start wrapping our mind around. So if you guys are interested in doing this, spread the word, send the invitation to the party, Come to Investor Party. We'll have a great time together. We want to have a quality community. So nobody who's nasty, negative, or judgmental. They're not allowed at my party. I kick them out. Mm -mm. Don't have that here. But people who want to learn and support each other, invite them in. Uh, we're going to be doing this again at 3 o'clock on Wednesday and Friday. And the next week, we'll be doing sign-ups for people who want to learn from our amazing stock team. Uh, and actually... What I do want to end on is I would like uh, you three traders, wonderful, wonderful traders, would you mind telling us how long it took you to become financially free through trading? You all have different answers, but what, how long it took you guys to become financially free through trading and how you did that? Well, we're going to start with uh, Sylvia. Um, I started trading when I was 36 years old and I became a single mom of three kids. Um, and I needed to, I had a really good job, which was a blessing, but I needed something because I didn't want to, um, when, when my kids had dance or when my, when my kids was in baseball or when I wanted to come across the country and visit my parents, I wanted to be able to afford those things without having to worry, will there still be bread on the table? So I started investing and I would say it took me four years to be able to quit my job but I wouldn't have called myself financially free at that point because I was still working. I was still, you know, bringing in money and, and building that trading account. Um, I would say financially free took me probably seven years. But you were able to leave your job in how many? Four. I was able to leave my job in four years. So I was, I was, but I was still working the accounts. I, I, I there was, there I wasn't financially free. I wasn't Bill Gates. <laughs> you were actively, you were, so you were, that's our earned income strategies. Still you very active. You a job yeah. for yourself trading. Correct. Yeah. Got it. Yep. My lovely Emily. Well, uh, unlike, opposite from Sylvia, I actually got thrown into this because I had just gotten laid off from a job. So I didn't mm -hmm. have an income coming in when I got, when I first started trading, but I made this my, um, my job, right, in a sense, right? So I learned how to trade to be able to generate um, a monthly income to be able to take care of the kids and pay the bills and all the other good stuff. So I'm still in progress because it's only been five years, but um, it's been it's been life changing. It's been it's been an awesome journey. It's been incredible. The things that I've learned, the people that I've met, um, the relationships that I've built over the years. And sometimes it's not always about. I always tell people sometimes it's not always about the wealth factor or the money factor it's the relationship the skill sets you learn um the confidence you gain and all the other things that come when you have that um that uh business entrepreneur mindset you just become a different person i think the the growth that i've had the most outside of just trading is just the confidence that i've gained in just being able to just you know just be a completely different person as an as an entrepreneur and not be afraid to take risks and 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 be open to different things and be open to um to different business ventures like the number of things i've gotten myself into since learning how to trade 
it's been ridiculous, right? So I'm not afraid to try something new. <laughs> so for me, I think that for me, that to me was is probably the most important factor than even the the becoming financially free is because I know that I can, I can just get up and do something and 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 create something and try it at least once. If it fails, I don't feel bad about it. I'm just like, okay, well that one didn't work. We can try something else, and and I don't feel bad about it. Yeah, I love that because when you're an entrepreneur, you 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 are no longer. That's the biggest freedom. I'm not scared of failing anymore. I'm going to fail. I accept it. I'm, I actually welcome it. I learn from it. I move on. I'm not scared of the F word. It's funny. I'm so glad you're willing to experiment with certain things. I, that was how I was when I was, what, 13? Anyway, Jake. It, it took me off of leveraged capital when I first started. My first account was all loan. <clears throat> took out a $25,000 personal loan for my first account. So off leveraged capital, it took me about a year and a half to really cash flow that, but it was a credit spread. So it was kind of like a sandwich lease option that could pay my bills enough, if that is a real estate hard analogy for you. It was about two and a half years before it was all my own cash that I had my own cash to create that off of it, if that makes sense, yep. right? Because nowadays I don't use leverage unless it's long-term real estate leverage at the moment. So like I'll take a mortgage sub 4% all day long, but that's the only, that's the only type, that and then stock margin of course, but not taking loans to trade like I used to. So, so when, what he's saying, guys, it's actually called a master sweep account where you have, say, a credit card that charges you 10% annual interest, but he's making 15% annual in, uh, return. So he's keeping a 5% spread. That's what the idea between the 10 and the 15, that, par, that spread is his profit. So he still had to pay back his loan, but he was coming back with 5% spread. That's actually one of my favorite things to do when I um, put together notes and I sell the notes. That's actually one of the ways I do it. So yeah. we'll Cause there, there is a reality to trading is you need money to trade. So I think that should be somewhat said in this type of webinar is that there's no way around that. You know, I know like real estate says no money, no credit, no problem. Like you need money to buy I a never stock. Do that. <laughs> Oh, but you know what I mean. I like, but mm -hmm. like there requires capital to buy stocks. Um, so uh, whether it's your capital or somebody else's capital, you're going to need a little bit of capital for sure. I could not say that better myself. Other yeah. Jake. All right. Well, Michael, I'm so glad you're here. I need a Grayson as Grayson's on your daily leave. He's gone. Um, my other amazing trainers. Thank you guys for being here so much. I'm so glad all of you made it today and you're here on the call. This was so much fun to have. Uh, and we're going to be doing it again on Wednesday and Friday. We'll have some of these guys returning. Some of them won't be, but they're going to be coming in and out. And hopefully you guys are getting excited for Stock Survivor. So be blessed. Mwah. Thank you guys so much. And we will see you at our party Wednesday. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Take care. Party on. Bye.